April 15, 2019, this year's tax hijacking day, if you're in the country we used to call America, and this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. We do appreciate you for tuning in on this particular Monday or Moon Day, as it were. Now, really quickly, we're going to get into just a couple of things before I start talking to the man himself, Jordan Maxwell, who you can follow over at Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com. Yes, you got to put all three of those words together, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Why? Because that is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. Also, there is a research society over there, which I do encourage you to join. It is for the deeper dives, terabytes of information, and still yet a lot more to come. Well, I just ordered that all wrong, but a lot more yet to come. How about that? Now I've corrected it. Anyway, all of that is happening at jordanmaxwellshow.com, along with a public area where you can make a donation. Contact Jordan. Let him know you what you think of this show and all his work. He does appreciate that. Of course, donations to Jordan Maxwell, because it is actually him would help toward his uh, well, well-being well as he goes forward in the world. You know, he's an older guy, and he's not exactly going to go out there getting a job flipping burgers. So if you think that uh, he's making a living coming on my show, you're wrong, too, because there's no money here. <laughs> But uh, anyway, all that happening, jordanmaxwellshow.com. I encourage you to go over there. Now, today's events, well, you know, just really quickly, because you guys don't want to hear from me, but just really quickly as we observe the cathedral at Notre Dame, you know, that place where the hunchback was and all that good stuff, allegedly, right? All that, you know, fairy tale nonsense. An icon of Christianity burning to the ground today. The spire has collapsed. The roof has fallen. The medieval construction is already gone, apparently. Paris, uh, you know, reacting and the mainstream reaction is as it is. You may not find that here tonight um, because, well, quite frankly, and here's just my opinion, this is not Jordan Maxwell's or anybody else's, but it actually made a lot of sense when I saw that headline. Um, besides that, it's Easter week, isn't it? We already saw people walking around with the ashes on their foreheads, which always confuses me. But anyway, you know, because people even go on television, you see politicians, policemen, everybody's got these ashes on their heads. It's it, it's an odd practice to me. It looks rather strange. But a- anyway, I am not a Christian. I have always said that. I, I, I believe in source. I believe in definitely the metaphysical world that I don't understand. And I quite frankly know that I am uh, too small of a being to fully fully reckon with the entirety of the universe so to understand the nature of a god that is something i don't try to do but jordan maxwell is with me and we are continuing the series on religion and an appropriate week on an appropriate day and in fact even if we consider the fact that tax day is happening and there are so many places that aren't going to be paying taxes i mean not just your large corporations that uh you know sell you widgets or poison or whatever that aren't going to pay any taxes uh as of the deadline today but religious organizations are also exempt from this automatically so hey a lot of things to consider jordan first thing to consider is how are you doing tonight well i think okay and i appreciate your kindness and having me back on, and uh, we'll see how well I'm doing <laughs> uh, as as we go on. But uh, thank you for having me back on again. Well, it's always a pleasure, and I, and I have really appreciated your patience with me continuing this conversation because it is a conversation. I've watched many of your lectures. I've, uh, uh, you know, obviously seen a lot of videos. I've seen a lot of people use video of you, uh, <laughs> so on and so forth. Um, you know, and, and I've mentioned that before. It, it is a, an unfortunate fact. Again, jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. And if you purchase something from there, make a donation, whatever, that helps Jordan's work one way or another and helps Jordan. And if you join the Research Society, that actually, Jordan has disclosed, goes toward his webmaster uh, in, in order to keep that section of the website continuously being updated with tons of information that goes a whole lot deeper uh, into each subject, including religion, which is the one we're going to focus on tonight, but also government money, uh, the, the grand corporations that are on the planet. All these things are really gone into in-depth there, and it's still a work in progress. So 
All right. I, I, I put two commercials at the beginning of the show for your websites, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's necessary. I, I am a member, by the way, of the Jordan Maxwell Research Society, which is what it's called. When you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, there's a big old button there, and you can follow the directions and uh, get in. Anyway, Jordan, it yes. is an interesting week, right? I mean, this is kind of fascinating because the icons are going to come out, and on the store shelves there's bunnies and eggs, and uh, people tell you about the resurrection. The thing that is the cornerstone, allegedly, of Christianity, really, the the, uh, the the crucifixion and then the resurrection after three days seems odd to me because it's at the wrong time of year for when, well, anyway, Jordan, <laughs> what, what do you, where, where would you begin to unpack Easter for somebody well, who's looking at it through a mainstream lens, but then wants to decode it as you do? Look at, you know, I think we've already talked about this on one of the prior programs, but I think it's actually appropriate because of the time, exactly the the week and the time is coming for Easter. I think it is appropriate that maybe we go back over this again. So people want to hear about the whole astral story of Easter, where it comes from and what it means. I think it's it's an appropriate subject we could talk about one more time. Mm Mm-hmm. When we talk about religious belief systems, all of our religious belief systems around the world seem to, especially in the Western world, seem to, and it looks like probably all over the world, East and West, a lot of our religious belief systems are based on the actual life of our solar system. Because this is where God is supposed to be. Where is God? He's out there. And where if you look out there, that's the heavens. And so we say that God is in heaven. Yeah, well, the heaven is the sky above you. And so what's going on in the sky above you uh, is affecting life on the earth as above, so below. And so we are now entering in a particular period, uh, which is called a season. It's not actually a a, a historical uh, monument. It's just a season. But this is what our religion in the Western world is based on, the the actual life of our solar system, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, etc. All of it's taken place out there in heaven. And so today we are now in an area, a time in which we're going to be celebrating Easter, and we say that Easter, according to Christianity, is a time when there's a resurrection. Jesus, we're told, is resurrected at this time of the year. And so everyone, all Christians know about something called an Easter sunrise service. When the Christians go out at 4.30 in the morning and get prepared bundle themselves up and go out into the wilderness and go out into a mountain top or somewhere and wait for the sun to come up on on Easter morning, on sunrise morning. And so it's called an Easter sunrise service. It's actually called a sun, S-U-N, sunrise service. Why? Because... First of all, you got to, when you're talking about the sun, the most important symbol in all theology is the sun. So ask yourself first, who owns the sun? We know that nobody on the earth can actually lay claim to own the sun. Uh, even the people who consider themselves to be gods on the earth, they can't own the sun. So therefore, the question first has to be asked, who owns the sun? Well, nobody seems to own the sun. So I suppose, theoretically, we could say, uh, you know, for lack of a better term and lack of a better answer, we could say theologically, God owns the sun. Well, since God owns the sun, it's God's son, and the God's son, we're told in the Bible, is the light of the world. 
So in Christianity, we know that Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. <clears throat> and, this, and of course, the sun over your head is the light of the world. It lights the whole earth every 12 hours. And so it's an idea that Jesus is a metaphor for the sun. That's why he's called God's son, the light of the world, because the sun is the light of the world. And since there is only one sun that God has given us, we don't have four of them. We only have one sun, so it's God's only begotten sun. He's the only one that God has given us. And that's the sun that comes up every morning, that warms the earth up so we could go out and go to work and live and grow plants and grow food and we can grow. And thank God that the sun is there for us to continue our, our life on the earth. This is what the Egyptians were aiming at when they said that the God's son was the light of the world and that he is, he has given his energy so that we might live. So therefore God's son is an energy, a symbol of energy in the universe. And without the sun, the earth would not have any energy at all. We get our energy from the sun. And so the ancient peoples realized that if the sun, if the sun uh, did not share its light and, and heat and, and energy with the earth, it could possibly last forever because it is a symbol for, for energy. So it is energy itself. But the sun, since it is energy itself, is actually giving its energy away to the solar system. The sun is providing all the planets and everything else in our solar system with energy. And so obviously energy can run out. And so they realize one day our sun is going to run out of energy. And when it does, the human family on the earth is going to run out with it because if there's no sun, there's going to get awful cold around on the earth real quick. And it's estimated that in three weeks we will be dead because no sun means total darkness forever and freezing cold and miles of ice over all of us. So you know what it gets like in, in the winter time, even in North America, when the sun's gone south for the winter, uh, that's why the birds also go south for the winter. They're going down where the sun is. You can stay here and go to work. They go down and go enjoy the sun down in Rio. So the bottom line is, who owns the sun? Well, God owns the sun. So Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. And so there is a connection between S-O-N and S-U-N. They both are spelled, they both spell and are pronounced the same way. One is S-O-N and S-U-N. Go back into your, your history books and read about the English language uh, and the forming of the English language, and you will find something called the lazy O effect in English. The people who were translating the words from the old, from the ancient world into the new world for England creating what we call English that was being created. It's a created language. And so the people who were translating all of this into English for us, all the words that are being used around the world, they said that there was something in English called the lazy O effect, meaning that that the translators that were giving us and, and pro providing for us this English language that they were building, they realized that S-O-N and S-U-N are interchangeable. So they called it the lazy O effect for the sun, which basically meant when you come up, when you come across the word sun, it doesn't matter. You can spell it S-U-N or S-O-N, whatever makes you happy. Whatever you think of, just use it, S-O-N or S-U-N. It doesn't matter. It means the same thing. So in the in English, which is called Low German, the English language is referred to scientifically as Low German. Well, in German language, high or low, in, 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 in the German language, 
that thing which comes up in the morning, it lights up the world, and it's spelled S-O-N, S-O-N for in German, for the sun. But we in America, we call it S-U-N. The rest of the world call it S-U-N. There it is again, the S-U-N or the S-O-N. Uh, it's a, it's a lazy O effect, meaning that there is no difference whatsoever between S U N and S O N, unless you choose to make it so by saying your male offspring is your S O N, your son. Why? Because he's the light of your light, and so there is an S U N that lights up your life, and then there's your S O N who lights up your life. And so, well, a couple things there, Jordan, really quickly. Uh, first, there is a question, uh, but but something just occurred to me when you were speaking that has never occurred to me before. When you said uh, we we call our we have a son, you're a parent, you're a father, you have a son. Uh, you know, yeah, sure, he's the center of your world. But in fact, the entire culture at one point was based on this idea of the first son. Right. Well, of course. Uh, yeah. Everything rested with the first son. The, the the true legacy, the inheritance, even today in law or what's allegedly law, <laughs> okay, <Yeah. clears throat> the oldest uh, offspring, the oldest son, if you will. Now, today they don't apply gender to it, but the oldest son has primary uh, control over what might be the family's assets, so to speak. I mean, mm-hmm. th- this is just the reality of the situation. And uh, continuing on with this, you mentioned seasons at the very beginning of what you were saying. So a little late, the questioner gets in after you had said it, uh, asked about the concept of season. If you break apart the word, you get sea and sun. And why is that? Because uh, let's see the, the, the exact question here. I will read it. Sorry, Jordan, takes me a few seconds to focus my eyes and to pull it up again. (laughs) But um, season. Okay, does this have to do with the phrase children of the sea? In other words, the sea fed all people at one time. And is this a direct reason why they talk about the seasons? Because the sea's suns were moved by the weather, and so were the fish, and so was the way of life. This is is a question I have for Jordan, and I'm not sure how to ask it. Okay, there, there's the whole text. <laughs> yeah, well, Go ahead. Uh, the very word season implies a three-month period of time in the life of our sun each year. So for three months, it's in spring. For three months, it's in summer. Three months, it's in uh, fall. And then, of course, in winter. And so there's 12 signs of the Zodiac assigned to the 12 months of the year. And so God's son is the light of the world. Well, of course, the God's son is the light of the world. But that's what we say about Jesus. He's God's son and he's the light of the world. Well, it's a metaphor. The whole story in the New Testament is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story telling you the life of that round globe that comes up in the morning. It lights up the world. It's so important to life on the earth that without the sun, there wouldn't be any life on the earth. And so it's the single most important feature of life on the earth is our sun. Thank God we've got a sun. And it's the only one. We don't have six of them. So we only have one sun that God has given us. So, so, you know, theoretically, we're talking spiritual subjects here. So God has given us his only begotten son. There's only one here. And so it's his only begotten son. And he is the light of the world. And so Jesus is a metaphor or a symbolic metaphor for the sun. And this is why Christians go out on Easter morning and go out and face the east at 4.30 in the morning before the sun comes up. And they're waiting for the sun to rise because the word on the Bible says God's sun is our risen Savior. Well, of course, it's your risen Savior. It rises every morning about 5.15. So the the sun is your risen Savior, and it is your Savior, because if it don't rise, we're dead. Nothing's going to grow on the earth, and we're going to freeze over if, uh, if the sun doesn't come up every morning, if it's not your risen Savior. So once you understand that the whole of the New Testament story of Jesus 
is a metaphor, it's a symbolic story telling you about the life of the heavens over our over our earth. <clears throat> From our earth, mankind has asked for incredible questions about life. All through our life on this earth for thousands of years, the great wise men of the different of the different empires have asked the same questions. And so since the answers are not forthcoming, mankind has had to sit and think about those questions and answer them themselves. So we have answered our own question about how does the world work and where do, where do, where does life come from and where do we come from and where do we go when we leave this world and how did we get here well you got here because you're alive because you have energy and you wouldn't have any energy if it wasn't for the sun so god's son created all things yeah the sun creates all matter because you can translate energy into matter and matter back into energy so the scripture says, without Jesus, nothing came into the world and nothing was created without him. What, what it's saying is that without the sun, there would be no energy to create anything, no life in the universe, no life in our solar system, period. So it's all based on the sun. Hmm. And the sun, obviously, as I said before, is one of the most important symbols in the heavens for divine presence in, in man's life is the sun because it comes up every morning. It is your risen savior. He's our risen savior. Right. And and the reason why is because if it, if he wasn't there, we'd freeze over and we'd all be gone real soon. Well, and scientific so, fact, like you said, nothing at all would ever grow on the planet as well. I mean, it's just that, that that's all there is to it. There would be nothing here without the right. sun. Be uh, nothing here on this planet, period. Right. It would be totally dark at our universe. And on all other planets, there would be no light anywhere. Mm. Because all the planets in our solar system all enjoy whatever life there may be on that planet. If there's any plants or anything on any, on any of the planets or on the moon or anywhere, if there is, they're getting energy to live from the sun. Right. Absolutely so, true. Now, really quickly here, uh, I did put out a, a message on Twitter for people if they wanted to ask questions. Uh, and we do encourage listeners to ask questions during the live show um, in the live chat room at Ocelli.com as well. Another one came in, but uh, I'm going to hold that off and just remind people that you can actually participate in the show and ask questions relevant to the discussion. Um, so there, there are a few coming in. I'm going to gather them up, Jordan, and let you continue on because this is a absolutely essential um, to, to understanding everything, basically. The, this yeah. idea that uh, the, the solar uh, messiah, the solar savior, the, the, there's a lot of different phrases people have used to describe this. And, uh, again, Jesus is not the only literary character uh, uh, to uh, share these uh these elemental <laughs> commonalities right. with other uh, uh solar messiahs so to speak i know the word messiah has a particular meaning but i, I don't have a, a a good what what would be another good word for that outside of savior messiah uh you know in the uh hebrew i think they would they would say mashiach uh yep. but either way all, all of these things uh they they are similar to well a, a template that has continued to be utilized throughout organized religion uh, ever since there were records of organized religion, uh, essentially, right? Precisely, absolutely. And in organized religions are basically telling you the story of life in, the, in our solar system. Life within the solar system uh, is being recorded and, and talked about and explained and what we call the New Testament, or in the Bible. So that the Bible is actually a, a retelling of an ancient, ancient story that was developed many th thousands and thousands of years ago. Mankind asked questions about life, and since there was nobody, uh, wasn't anybody coming to, to tell him, men began to put together ideas about how things happen and why they happened the way they did and where life came from. And so they began putting together a story for themselves. 
so that they could answer their children when the children asked, where did we come from? The, you know, the humans could tell them that God created us. Well, what does that mean? They don't know what it means. They just know that that's what we say. So they were developing ideas for themselves and putting together whole churches and whole political and social movements we call churches and synagogues to promote the, these ideas that men have come up with. And so they came up with the idea that the sun was the center of our world. It's the center of our whole world. Without the sun, we wouldn't have a world. And so the New Testament is a story uh, which is referred to as the greatest story ever told. Why is it referred to as the greatest story ever told? Because it's the only story that has ever been told about anything in life in our solar system. It's the oldest story ever heard by anyone. It goes back to way before Egypt. It goes back into India, to ancient India. All the ideas that have come from the ancient world, what we talk about today, we use today, the terms and the words all came from the prehistoric and ancient world. And so you need to understand the religion of India and then the religion of the Egyptians and the Persians and the, and the Russians and the Romans and the, as, as the Europeans. And God knows it just keeps going back and back and further and further into history. But the basic story of the New Testament today in the Bible that supposedly the Christian churches are representing is Jesus. Jesus is a metaphor for the Son. There was no man who actually walked the earth who was called mm -hmm. Jesus. There is the idea that the Son was given to us by God. So it's God's Son. And God's Son is the light of the world. And of course, the Son is the light of the world. And the Son has always done battle with an evil brother in heaven. The evil brother was the devil. And so Jesus is, has always been at war with the devil. And the devil is simply taking the word evil and putting a D in front of it. And it becomes devil. And and you take an O out of the word good, it becomes God. God is good and the devil is evil. We're just using words and terms that have been developed for us called English. And so the story of the New Testament story of Jesus is retelling the most ancient story ever told. That's why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It is the greatest story because it's the only one. The Son is our Redeemer, our Savior, and because it's giving its, its energy to the earth continually, 24 hours a day, it's causing life to exist on the earth because without his life, the story in the Bible is that Jesus gave his life so that we humans might live. We might live forever. No, we won't live forever, but there will always be forever life on the earth because of the sun. As long as the sun comes up every morning, there's going to be insects and animals and people, and God knows what else is going to be able to be born on this earth but there will always be life on the earth of some kind as long as that sun comes up. Man may have blown himself up, but there will be insects that will still be alive and animals that will still be alive. So therefore, the sun is giving his life so that you might live. He's giving his energy so that you might have energy to live. Mm. God's son has died for you. He's dying because he's giving away his energy. And eventually, one day, he will give it all up and he'll be gone. So God's son is giving his life so that you might live. <clears throat> and now you get into the, the, the idea that the son has four different lives in this, in this setting, in this uh, solar system. We have four different times when the son is prominent in our belief system. Four different seasons. This is why you have in the Bible, you have the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why four, by, four Gospels? Because there's only four seasons. And all four seasons are telling you the story of God's Son, the light of the world, our risen Savior. 
<clears throat> so you have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, representing spring, summer, autumn, winter. <clears throat> and now when you go back to the picture, uh, the, I think it was um, uh, Da Vinci. I believe it was Da Vinci that painted this, The Last Supper, where it shows Jesus at the table and the 12 apostles are around him. It's called The Last Supper. Right. A lot of people don't realize what the Last Supper is. The Last Supper is the last Passover meal in Judaism. The last Passover is referred to in Christianity as the Last Supper because supposedly the 12 apostles sat and had dinner and had the supper, had their dinner with Jesus the night he was going to die. He's going to die now. He was your master. He's your teacher. And everyone knew he's going to give his life so that you might live. So he's going to die. And so all of his closest associates, the 12 apostles, which represents the 12 months of the year or the 12 signs of the Zodiac, they come to Jesus to have dinner with him. They're going to, one more time, they're going to meet with God's son. And then he's going to die in the age of Pisces. And he's now going to be reborn. Three days later, he's going to be reborn and become born again in the age of Aquarius. And that's where we're heading now. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Aquarius is just one of the 12 signs of the Zodiac. Right. And today we are living in one sign of the Zodiac, which is over 2,150 years old. Each one of the signs of the Zodiac are 2,150 years old. Well, we're 2,019 years into 2,150. So we're now in the last days, the last and final days of this old world order. The old order is leaving us, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. That's what the book of Revelation says. Mm. The new heavens and the new earth is going to be because the sign of Aquarius is getting ready to show itself. This is it's not here yet, but this is the dawning. It's just now beginning to show itself. The coming dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's why the song says this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. It's not here yet. The sun hasn't risen in Aquarius yet. We're 2019 years into a 2,150-year period. So the 2,000s already gone. Right. So we're in the last days, the final days, in the last days. You hear Christians talking about it, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and all the Christian cults, the Masonic cults out of New York, all the what we call the York Rite Masonic cults that we call them Christians, they're all talking about we're living now in the final and last days. Right. The, and what's interesting and, here, Jordan, is the final and last days, a lot of people think, you know, it's a few years away. It is not, in in, in a very technical sense, if you look at it astrologically, um, we still have about 130 years, as you basically laid out here without telling people directly. There's about 130 years before that age is in effect, basically. That's right. But like you said, when the sun is rising, if one goes and observes the sunrise, which I have done many times in my life, you got to acknowledge this. Before you see the sun, you begin to see an effect in the sky. The air begins to get a bit warmer in, in a very yep. physical way. <clears throat> you can... Uh, relate this to what it is you're talking about, because before the sun does, in fact, rise, there are things that begin to happen. So the dawning or the dawn coming into effect is happening there before the sun is observable, before the sun is actually risen on the horizon, right? Precisely. So, precisely. So, exactly. That's why the mm -hmm. sun represents light, L-I-G-H-T, light. When it is translated into enlightenment in your head, in your mind, when you are enlightened, it means someone who was very brilliant, who shines very brightly, was trying to explain something to you that you were in the dark about. Then you say when you finally get it, most people don't get it at all, but if you finally get what the person is trying to say, you say things like, oh, it just dawned on me. 
Oh, yeah, it just dawned on me what you were saying. Now I understand it. It just dawned on me, Mm -hmm. meaning the light from God's Son, the light of the world, is now actually working in my head, and I'm no longer in the dark about things. I'm no longer being led by the prince of darkness, the devil, evil, stupidity, ignorance, Mm -hmm. ill-informed, unread, dingbat, screwball, ignorance. I, it just dawned on me what you were saying. It means that the sun represents, spiritually speaking, symbolically speaking, light in the, your head. And if you don't have light in your head, then you're in the dark and you're bumping into everything all day long. So you need to enlighten yourself. And then you have light. And then you can say, oh, it dawned on me what you're saying. Oh, I see what you're saying. What do you mean you see what I'm saying? Well, I can see it with spiritual light, uh, eyes that can see spiritual things. Mm. And so, so uh, the idea- I, I was going to tell you that a few questions are starting to pile up now, and one mm-hmm. of them relates to the Last Supper and uh, the last days of Christ in the story. So I'm going to enter that one here first. So these might be out of order, guys, for you sending in questions. But I'm going to bring them up when they're relevant, and you can still do that either on Twitter or at Ocelli.com in the chat room if you like. Uh, and, and Jordan has happily responded to every single question that has been asked uh, throughout this series of now 22 episodes. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's get to it really quickly here. They're asking um, – well, let me just read it – directly uh, the betrayal of Christ and this concept of Judas – selling him out for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Numerology is a big part of magic with a K. And I am asking Jordan if he knows what the significance of the 30 pieces of silver would be. And what does Judas really have to do with the story as the betrayer? Now, I know that we have covered this before, Jordan, uh, a little bit. But uh, maybe you could put it in context with The Last Supper. The yeah, fact that yeah, this was absolutely, a Passover. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the the Jews will tell you, Jews in the Jewish religion, you have the story of the Passover. And, and the Jews will tell you that the Passover is one of the most important uh, religious celebrations in the whole year is the Passover. Very important. Why? Because it's the beginning of spring. When the, the, the sun has gone down south, it has left the northern equator. The northern equator is freezing to death during the winter with snow on the ground and ice everywhere. It's snowing and it's freezing cold, very uncomfortable. So we humans in the northern hemisphere, we say the sun is useless to us. It's not doing anything for us. It's just freezing cold all the time because we're in the winter. That's a particular that's a particular season, but at the same time in the southern hemisphere, the sun has gone all the way down to the southern hemisphere, and they are experiencing on our winter. They're experiencing their summer <clears throat> because the sun is now down there. They're going to the beach and now and, and enjoying the warm sunshine. And then when our winter, when our summer begins, that's their winter down in the Western Hemisphere. So the whole idea is the story of the sun in the life of the sun in our solar system. And so that's why it's called the greatest story ever told. It's the oldest story ever told by anyone. And it has to do with all the religions of the world acknowledging that the sun is the most important symbol that represents, and this is important, it represents the qualities of what man would refer to as God. <clears throat> the scripture says that no man has ever seen God, but the sun is the most, uh, uh, the most obvious symbol for the qualities that we assume that God must have. If we can't see God, you can at least see his offspring. You can see his son. And so his son, when you've seen, like Jesus said, when you have seen the son, you have seen the father. Well, we say the same thing. When we see your boy, he looks just like you. So when he talks, he sounds just like you. And so even if we haven't seen you in a while, but we saw your son the other day, 
and we were seeing you. He was a spinning image of you. So when you see the Son, you've seen the Father. Well, Jesus is saying, when you see the Son with its light, that's the wonderful qualities of God. God is very brilliant. He's filled with light. He's highly intelligent. Whatever God is, is represented by the Son. Why? Because the Son gives you life, and so God gives you life. Well, the Son keeps your plants growing and your children growing and your world is growing. 20, every 24 hours because the sun is causing life to exist on the earth. So the sun represents symbolically all of the wonderful qualities that we humans would imagine God having. God is extremely intelligent. He's very, very bright. Well, you don't get anything brighter than going out and staring at the noonday sun. So God's, uh, he is very bright. He sure is. And he's a he's a god of war and a god of fire. Well, of course, the sun is a god of fire. Hmm. That's what we uh, that's what we symbolically think of as the sun's on fire, but it's not on fire. It's not you know the the heat the uh, the the flames from the sun do not heat the earth. We're not being heated by the flames from the sun. And the reason we know that because the higher up you go, the more colder it gets. And so if you go in a spaceship, if you go out in a rocket and, and head toward the sun, you will find that the astronauts have those huge, thick, enormous suits on that have that have heaters in them and air conditioners in them. Hmm. But why? Because when you put on those heavy suits, they are extremely hot, and so you have to cool yourself off. But they're wearing those suits because the outer space is so cold that you would freeze to death instantly if you if you went out there. And so we know that the sun's rays are not uh, warming the earth. <clears throat> We're not being warm because of the, the fire on the sun. We're being warm because the sun is sending out electrical waves of energy. And those energy waves... If you're standing on a desert and look straight out, when the sun's overhead, it will look like a mirage. You'll see water in the air, and you'll think it's a lake. And then the further you go out to the lake, the less you see of it. And the obviously is, yes, the reason why you're seeing a mirage, because there is water in our atmosphere. There's plenty of water in our atmosphere, and you breathe in all that water continually. That's why keep, your lungs are always very wet. Why? Because you're breathing in water. Remember, you were in your mother's womb, and you were breathing water. You were inside of a bag of water. Mm. So you're, 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 you're able to breathe in water, and so that's what we're doing. And it's called a mirage. No, you're just seeing the air from a long distance away and the water in the atmosphere builds up to it begins to look like a lake. Mm. And so we say it's a mirage. No, it's not a mirage. You're actually seeing water. It's the water in the atmosphere. Right. But, you know, another so, thing to consider here, uh, Jordan, very quickly, is that when one considers the way the story is written, and the idea that uh, God's son comes and he is the messenger too. He he brings the message, the the God's word. Um, this is much like the behavior of men, reality wise. Of course. Uh, who 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 gets your will? Generally speaking, your if you only have one son, uh, certainly he would be the one who inherits. Uh, what it is you've done, your message. A lot of fathers take pride in the fact that their sons continue their work or get into the family business, so to speak. I know it sounds almost funny, but it, it, it's not meant to be but a joke. That's true. It's, it, but it's the idea here that that's why the story is written the way it is. So it begins to make sense, even in a literary way, uh, the way that's it was right. constructed. Now, uh, I, I want to lay something else on you, and you're not going to believe this, but I've got multiple people asking me for you to comment on this through messages on Twitter and also through public tweets now uh, because, uh, as I said at the top of the show, uh, no, the, the Cathedral of Notre Dame is burning, yes. Uh, it's burning as we speak still, I think, and uh, has been engulfed in flames, but also uh, there are reports that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is also on fire. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I just I, I throw that at you, and there's a there's a bunch of questions here too, uh, Jordan. But I wanted to throw this at you because it is an important time of year, and uh, uh, in 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 all of Christendom, so to speak, right? Uh, anybody who is in the Western world that observes Christianity, I know very sure is uh is paying extra special attention to these events uh is thinking about these things at this exact time because of what it is you're explaining right now um and i don't know if you want to comment on it yet i i really want to look into it further before i get into the esoteric uh symbolism that may very well being uh displayed to the whole of the world as we speak but i think that this is significant um, and, uh, and is, and is worthy of mention. And as I said, I will enter all discussions into this because, uh, there were also, uh, other public questions and, uh, private, <laughs> not only asking yep. you about those 30 pieces of silver, but also asking you, uh, about the significance of this going on now that world events are often, uh, driven by calendar dates due to the fact that they possess numeric significance, uh, for the practices of dark, uh, excuse me, dark, um, where, where's the word? <laughs> uh, uh, well, a- anyway, oh, dark rituals, excuse me, dark rituals. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I'm, I'm reading this stuff as it's coming in, by the way, Jordan, so my apologies. Uh, but, but either way, this is what is on the mind of the people listening to you right now. Um, and so, so I bring it to you to address it. I think it's extremely relevant when you're talking about what you're talking about. It indeed is. By the way, Easter still simultaneously uh, goes right along with Passover as far as uh, Jewish practice and Christian practice. Now, uh, they they are during the same time of year. Um, anyway, and now they also have the same celebrations. They they really do, don't they? They have the same celebrations on in what we call Christmas. They call uh, celebrating of a of a celebration of lights. Mm. Well, a Passover a, seder, right? Isn't it a seder they call it when they do the? Uh, all I know is that is that in, in mid to late December in Judaism, you have something called the festival of lights. Right. L i g h t. That's the exact exact exactly why. And Christmas, all the people who decorate their home for Christmas always have what lights. They always light up the Christmas tree. It's a festival of lights. And then the Jews call it the festival of lights. Of course, it's a festival of lights. It's a festival of the stars, the planets in the heavens, God's sun, the light of the world, and the stars in the heavens. Mm. Uh, it's really a very big, big story, this astral theology study. And it takes for years for you to study this subject of astral theology and the ancient religions of the prehistoric world. But once you finally get it, then you can say, oh, now I see what's being said. For the first time, now I understand what Judaism is, where it came from, what Christianity actually is. And now I know for the first time what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Jesus in the Bible is a story that's encoded. Right. It's a symbolic encoded story. But but even what's public, publicly observable is encoded because you mentioned the Christmas lights, right? And, and we're yep. getting down to the last 10 minutes of this hour, and I promise I'm going to keep my mouth a lot more shut during the second hour except to bring the questions forward mm-hmm. to Jordan. Uh, I wasn't promising that to you, Jordan. I'm promising that to the listeners who are probably sick of hearing from me and want to hear from you more. Uh, the fact well, uh, is— Yeah, but I appreciate your, your, your helping out and— Helping to clarify things. Yeah. Well, I, you know, listen. All I'm here to do is facilitate this, and I, I'm doing my best. Uh, but it's it's a broad <laughs> topic, and not not easy for everyone to uh, to tackle or to uh, begin to uh, uh, illustrate for anyone. But anyway, another thing that is uh, publicly observable, and and here's what starts to emerge, is the synchronicity and the symbolism that is contained on multiple levels. You see. These practices and icons, they continue to repeat and to echo in various ways. You, you talked about the Festival of Lights. Well, of course, what do we do, though? We put those lights on a tree if we're in you know, right. Western Christian civilization or just Western civilization, because now it's even beyond people that are religious necessarily. It's just a cultural thing. 
But That's right. Putting lights on a tree, you know, it almost reminds me of that whole burning bush concept, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, See, now well, you're thinking. Now you're thinking. It, yep. And that's, but that's the point of this, is that it goes in so many directions. It's not as though there is a simple, look, here's the ABC answer. See, there, there's double A's and double B's and double C's and triples. <laughs> right? You got that right. It's they, a huge subject. And they line up. In, in such a fascinating way, and you're you're the uh, you know you're you're the guy who's been doing this for so many years, uh, uh, explaining this and laying this out for people, and uh, I, I just want to say you know that again I don't say it often enough, but it's been a, a real privilege to uh, to be able to even uh, facilitate this uh, th- this very very interesting and very large series, which I, I I hope you guys are downloading, getting. I'm putting it out publicly everywhere that I can. Uh, and as per Jordan's request, you know, I don't put every show up on YouTube, but as per Jordan's request, every one of these shows ends up on YouTube. That's just the way it is. Uh, there's a little delay on it, you know, for the YouTube listener, but you know, you, you, you want to go get it, you go get it from us directly. You know, you want to, uh, fumble through the uh, wild world of YouTube. It, It might take you a little while, but it's okay. Either way, I put it out every single place I can. And why? Because even though we've done 44 hours <laughs> we're not even remotely close to complete about this story no, jordan no, has a whole lot more to say and i advise you before i give jordan the last word on this hour i advise you the listener to go over to jordan maxwell show.com and join the research society why because this subject along with everything else that interlocks with it Okay, I want you to to understand that phrase. These these are all interlocking subjects. When it comes to the monetary uh, uh, system, when it comes to governments in general, when it comes to the, quote, law, end quote, when it comes to the way governments behave, when it comes to the way international organizations and organisms, if you will, behave, all of these things are studied in depth in the Research Society. And if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, you can join it for a one-time fee and get a lifetime membership. I have one. I really encourage you to do that. But also, go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com, interact with Jordan, make a donation, download. There's a couple streaming videos over there, too. You can download those. They're not too expensive, um, you know, and, and a lot cheaper than it would be to order a DVD and have it delivered to you, and you have it. It's yours. So this is a good thing, but joining the Research Society, you can get a deep dive into all these subjects, and there is... Uh, over a terabyte of information on there now. There's more coming. There's been uh, some recent ads that I was looking at uh, a couple days ago because I wanted to check up on something. Um, and given the fact that these events that are unfolding right before our eyes in the, quote, real world, end quote, uh, are all related to this interlocking matrix of subjects that I do believe uh, center and rest upon the concept of religiosity and religious behavior, which is not necessarily holy behavior, uh, in my estimation. You know, reli- what, what is something that is religious that is something that you do regularly? Um, That's right. And th- th- this, is, this is a fact. This is what I believe a lot of these systems, a lot of these people, a lot of these behaviors, a lot of the incomprehensible things you see in the headlines absolutely rest upon is this particular subject. And again, I'm extremely grateful to Jordan Maxwell for uh, uh, taking us through this, you and me. And and I'm going right along with you guys. I am going through this and learning and experiencing and, and trying to add anything I can to this uh, because Jor- just like Jordan, I care very much that people are aware and understand the world around them much better. JordanMaxwellShow.com, again, is, is Jordan's website. And I, uh, I I wholeheartedly tell you, and I'll give you the links with the podcast as well, uh, along with my other notes and so on and so forth. But uh, I, I want you to go there when you're done listening to this show or pause this show and go listen to it if you're catching it on podcast. But if you're listening live, you can add questions to in the chat room or on Twitter. Meanwhile, Jordan, uh, with the last couple of minutes here, I don't know exactly what direction we'll take next hour because we don't script this. But uh, but I think this has been a, a brilliant discussion thus far about uh, some of the topics you've already covered on the show. Um, but, you know, it, 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 there, there's so much more to get into. Is there ever? Boy, it's an enormous ancient story that goes all the way back into ancient 
lands into the ancient Middle East, into China, into Asia. It goes back into the most ancient times of, of life on this earth. We don't know how far back mankind really goes, but you go all the way back to the beginning. Mankind has always asked the same questions and have never had an answer, so they make their own answers up. And we call those answers that, that our ancient forefathers dreamt up and came up with great ideas to explain the questions that we have today. We refer to those ideas. They put them into, into a, a whole orchestrated movement we call a religion, a, a religious belief system. And these were just ideas that humans came up with, and we built a story, and it's called the greatest story ever told. The Bible is a encoded metaphor, symbolic story, telling you about the war between light and darkness, between God's Son, the light of the world, Jesus, and his evil enemy, which we call the Prince of Darkness. And the Prince of Darkness was always known in Egypt as Set. S-E-T was the Prince of Darkness. And so that today we say the same thing. It gets darker right around sunset. But Set was the Prince of Darkness in Egypt. And Jesus was the Prince of Light. He was the light of the world. And so there's a whole story here of, on the mythology of the ancient prehistoric world that we are still, still living it out today. And it's such a big story. It's so difficult because I don't like having to repeat myself. But on the other hand, you know, it bears witness that things I've said before need to be said, said again in the context of a new discussion. Mm -hmm. So the sun has four different lifetimes each year with us humans. The sun serves us in four different ways. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four gospels represent the four seasons. The 12 apostles represent the 12 months of the year or the 12 signs of the zodiac. And so I think we talked about the fact that when you hear the word God's kingdom, that's something else we could talk about when, when we come back. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about all of this when we come back because it's getting ready to go to a break. Absolutely. Jordan Maxwell, we're going to talk about this and a lot more in the continuing series on religion, which I've called Special Dogmatic Theology. And this is, I think it's part 22, but I'll have to check but I know if we've gone well over 21, and Jordan and I will be right now uh, originating from Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. Greetings especially to our friends over in the land of scholars and saints, which is the nicest and most neutral way I can describe uh, one of my ancestral connection. Ha! Ah, tripping over my tongue, sorry. Ancestrally connected homelands. Ireland. Uh, cause you know, I'm, I'm not only Sicilian, I'm Irish. Good combination, eh? Anyway, uh, <laughs> Sicilian and Irish. And yeah, I know, I know, but, but let's not go there. Fact is that uh, we are broadcasting live over in Ireland. We are being heard in Scotland. We are being heard in various places on the planet live. But of course, a lot of you will pick this up via the podcast later on. And we do appreciate all of you. Jordan Maxwell is with me. I am certainly taking questions both in the chat room at Ocelli.com, which is a live chat room. You can interact over there. Hopefully you behave well and you stick to the subject matter. Do appreciate any questions entered there or on Twitter. I've apparently invited people to do that, and I'm getting a lot of commentary and uh, a few questions over there. So uh, please continue to do so. I will add them into the conversation as they are appropriate. Now, why is it that I'm doing that? Because Jordan Maxwell, and by the way, jordanmaxwellshow.com is his website. It is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. You can see his name used in a lot of places. You see his name used to sell products and so on and so forth. And there are people making money, but it's not Jordan. Uh, and, and he's not making the money. Just so you know that, the only website that is his, the only website where you make a contribution and it goes to him, the only website where you're actually interacting with him is jordanmaxwellshow.com, which also has a research society connected to it. You click a button over there. You can join the Jordan Maxwell Research Society for a one-time fee and become a lifetime member. 
and get deeply into all of the subjects which are being covered tonight and a lot more. Uh, but that journey begins at jordanmaxwellshow.com. So all of that out of the way, we're certainly discussing Easter. We're, we're discussing some of the events that are apparently unfolding as we speak on the planet where I find it metaphorically interesting that uh, apparently the Al-Aqsa Mosque is on fire and uh, the cathedral at Notre Dame, Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame. Okay, I'm not sure exactly if that's the correct pronunciation, but I think it's close. I don't quite do the nasally French thing, which is a requirement when you speak it, but you, you get the point. Anyway, this is going on, plus a lot of other things, and it is that season, uh, the holiday season, so to speak, but this is for Easter, and, uh, well, a lot of things are happening, and we started talking about that to begin with. So, Jordan, before we get started again, I'm going to uh, bring in a couple questions here. <laughs> Uh, one of them is about what you're seeing and, uh, and, and the symbolism in it, uh, which is also connected to another question. So we'll just put it all together. Uh, Super Trader asks about the ritual. Super Trader is a, a Twitter handle, by the way. Super Tra Trader asks, um, do you, uh, do you believe that uh, the practice of magic by the elites and people in the Pentagon uh, has something to do with them attempting to contact dark entities to achieve their goals? Um, now, I reworded that question a little bit because it was a little choppy the way it was worded. But effectively, the people in power, are they utilizing black magic and magic with a K, by the way, uh, in order to uh, attempt to achieve their goals? Do you think that that is a reality? Uh, first of all, and next, um, in that symbology, in that symbolic ritualism that takes place, um, another question is here regarding the numbers. And do you think it is a mistake that this is precisely the day that uh, there is a fire in Paris? Uh, does it not seem coincidental that it is? <laughs> well, you mentioned the same things I do here. Uh, and this is... Um, Taylor, which I believe Taylor is a, a female. So the female Taylor asks, do, do you think that uh, the fact that it is tax day in America, it is the Easter week, it is after Palm Sunday, but before uh, Easter Sunday, uh, that this is all why someone would burn uh, intentionally? And, well, see, intentionally is a tough word, guys. How, how are Jordan and I to know if something was intentionally done? I wouldn't want to make that accusation. But about the symbolism that's going on, because, first of all, I have no one to accuse, no evidence. But uh, do, does it hint at, is it your opinion that it would make sense that this is happening at this time, that if someone did have an intent, intent to make a point, how about that, uh, that they would uh, do it at this particular time? So those two questions I combine, and sorry for the long-windedness there, Jordan, but I wanted to fairly combine the two questions uh, for you and just hand it to you. So go well, ahead. I think there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the powerful people that run this planet are continually in conversation, working directly with the occult powers, the demonic powers, depravity going on, on the earth is evidence that there is some sort of a, an occult secret society that are continually trying to monitor the powers that be in the spirit world and Hollywood's making movies about it continually like the exorcist and, and there's a lot of demonism and devil worship going on around the world demonism that doesn't even present itself as, as devil worship. People who actually believe that what they're doing is they're doing something religious, have no idea in the world what they're actually involved in is religions based on the worship of demons and devils and spirits that they cannot see. And since most people can't see spirits, they don't believe they're there and they don't give any credence to it. But the fact of the matter is, the world that we live in is being guided by, and the destiny of the human family is being guided by spiritual entities that we cannot see. And they seem to be very, very evil because of the, by the fruits you should know them. Look at the fruitage of the spirit world that we live in today, and look at the world that we have to live in, you know, because of it. With the, uh, with the, Drugs and alcoholism and violence and hatreds, 
and and uh, and the continuation of selling drugs around the world. Uh, all of these big big uh, drug companies and big drug dealers in Central and South America with their billions of dollars they're making on illicit drugs. They would not be making that kind of money if it wasn't that America was buying the drugs. We're the ones who are the uh, are at fault for the drug cartels because we're buying all the drugs from the Middle East cartels, from these Cali, uh, you know, cartels. And so you can't blame them. They're just they're just supplying a demand. But in America, we love the drugs. We're buying them. We can't get enough. We want a main life. Why? Because Americans have lost their jobs. They've lost their country. They've lost their freedom. They've lost their 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 production capacity. They've lost everything. They've lost their freedom. They've lost everything. And now there's only one thing left to lose, and that's their mind. And now America is in the process of losing its mind. And so... Getting back to our subject of astral theology, the ancient story of the world we live in in relation to the heavens above our solar system. The sun is the... Uh, let's start like where, where we did last time. Let me start over by saying to understand what's going on right now with our celebrations and the world we live in, just know that the sun in the northern hemisphere on the first day of summer, is as high in the northern hemisphere as it's going to go. On the first day of summer, it's not going to go any further north. It's stopped. And that's as high as it's going to go in the northern hemispheres on the first day of summer. So therefore, he's what we call God's son, the light of the world. He is really hot. We say that because he's very very impressive. He's really hot. But then 90 degrees later on, on a circle, you count 90 minutes later or 90 degrees or 90 days. 90 degrees represents the 90 days. We'll take three months, uh, 30 days apiece, and that's 90 degrees or 90 days later. All right, so 90 days later, the sun that was really hot in summer He's not that hot anymore. He used to really be hot, but he's not that hot. He's not dead yet, but he's not that hot either. So we say he's fallen. He's fallen from his position as being the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah was the sun in the summer. And, and, and the lion, of course, was Taurus. It goes back to the lion was Leo, the lion, the constellation of Leo, in the Zodiac is the lion of the tribe of Judah, Leo the lion. Why? Because the sun is in the constellation of Leo in the first day of summer. And, and summer is always associated with the, uh, with the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, he was very hot in summer, but he's not that hot in the, in the fall. So we say he has fallen a bit. He's fallen. Why? Because 90, degree, 90 degrees or 90 days later, after he's the hottest thing on, on the earth, he's now not that hot, so we say he has fallen. So we call that beginning, uh, we call it fall, because fall means the sun was hot, but he's not that hot anymore, so he's fallen. So the symbol for the that that time of year for fall is a Scorpio, the constellation of Scorpio, the scorpion. And scorpions are backbiters. They're deadly because they're backbiters. And so in the Middle East, when a scorpion bites you, it leaves on your skin a cut and the two and the as two cuts on your skin. When a scorpion bites you in the Middle East, there's two single cuts on your skin. And those two cuts together look exactly like a pair of human lips. This is why they say when you have been bitten by a scorpion in the Middle East, they just gave you the kiss of death. The, the scorpion now kissed you off because you're going to die if a scorpion has, has bitten you in the Middle East and left two, two holes in your, in your skin that look like uh, two human lips, so there's the kiss of death. 
And so now we know that God's son, the light of the world, our great risen savior, he's really hot in summer, but now he's falling. And so now in the autumn, he's falling. And so one of the 12 signs of the zodiac was, was, uh, uh, Scorpio. And Scorpio, if you go back into the ancient records in Christianity, go back to the ancient Vatican records back in the 5th and 6th century, they talk about the 12th apostle, the apostle Judas, represented Scorpio. He was a backbiter. He was a killer. He went behind your back and, and turned you in. So he was a backbiter. And so he represents the beginning of fall. So therefore, Jesus was a lion of the tribe of Judah. He was really hot for a while until he was betrayed. And so that's why the, the, the scripture doesn't say that Jesus was kissed by Judas so that Judas could identify Jesus. No, you don't need to identify Jesus. Everybody in the world knew who he was. Even the Caesars of Rome knew. Uh, who Jesus was. If he was around at all, everybody would know who he was. And they'd know where he is. So why did Judas go out and kiss Jesus? It doesn't say he kissed him to identify. Everybody knew who he was. He didn't live in a city like Chicago. He just lived in a little small town in the Middle East, we're told. And therefore, there had been no difficulty in the, at all trying to find Jesus. He just lived in a little small town. It'd take you a half an hour to walk across town and Jesus lived there in the Middle East. So therefore, Judas did not kiss Jesus to identify. It says actually in the scripture, Jesus was kissed by Judas to betray him. Not identify, but to betray. Meaning that the sun, who was really hot in summer, has now finally hit fall. And now... Now fall is going to betray God's son, the light of the world, and he's going to die. He's been given the kiss of death and sent down south. That he's going to die down south in the southern hemisphere. And so to us here in the northern hemisphere, we say that the son is gone. He's dead to us. He's, he may be helpful to somebody down south, but he's not of any value to us. We're freezing the death of fear. And so the sun goes down, and on December 20, I think it's the 21st, on December 21st, it's the beginning, official beginning of winter. So it's called the winter solstice. That's another time. Now winter has begun for us officially on December 21, which means on December 21, down southern hemisphere, officially summer has began, began for them. But our winter has begun for the Northern Hemisphere on December 21. And the sun has gone all the way down to the Southern Hemisphere, and it stops. It doesn't go any lower than the 21st of December. It's called the winter solstice. But the sun was going south, but it stops at December 21 and does not go any further south. And so we say that God's son died for three days because for three days, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th on December down south, December 22, 23, and 24, the sun rises on the exact same, uh, the exact same degree. And it doesn't go any further south. It doesn't come back north either. So for three days, it rises in the same place. And so, the pendulum has stopped, and now it's getting ready to swing backwards again. But for three days, it doesn't move. So the ancient people said that the son was dead for three days. He died for three days. And if you're down in Rio, if you've ever been down to Brazil and down to South America, you will know that in the southern skies of the earth, in the southern skies down there <clears throat> on December 24th, 25th, there is a star system in the sky in the south down there in South America. There's a star system that is exactly a actual cross. It looks precisely like a cross. The, the, the stars are placed exactly in a cross. And so the sun is dead now to us up here. Totally, he's gone. So he died on a cross. 
the cross is called the Southern Cross of the Southern Apostles of the Southern Hemisphere. It's called the Southern Cross. Look it up. It's an actual cross made up of stars. And so we say God's Son died on the cross. It's called the Southern Cross Constellation. Now, well, right, right Jordan. Now, now, here's the thing. <clears throat> Just really quickly here. You answered Sheila's question before I got a chance to a- ask it <laughs> because uh, she, she said, well, how does this relate to the uh, crucifixion and Jesus dying on the cross? Literally, that's what she asked uh, a few minutes before you told us. And uh, yeah. just a little side note, uh, I've been to South America. In fact, I've been to Brazil. I've been to Sao Paulo. Uh, and, uh, well, quite frankly, Jordan is absolutely accurate with what he's describing. You can observe this very clearly in the heavens, so to speak. So, um, yeah, that's absolutely correct. I can tell you that from firsthand experience. So, uh, pl- please continue. Uh, so then on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun rises on the same identical uh, uh, degree and the U.S. Navy has the instruments that can prove it that the sun does not move any further south or doesn't uh, doesn't head northward. It rises on the same degree for three days. So for three days, the sun, which has been moving all year long, started back in the summer and it, then he fell and then he's now in in December twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth is dead for three days. Why? Because he's not moving. And then on December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward. And like I said, the naval instruments can prove that. The U.S. Navy can show you on on their dials that the sun has moved one degree northward, which means it is now born again. It has come back to life. It was dead for three days. Now the sun has come back to life. And now it will begin its annual journey, working its way back to us in the northern hemisphere. And so as summer begins to die down the southern hemisphere, summer begins to die, our, our, the sun is coming back to us in the northern hemisphere. And so the ancient people said, especially in Egypt, that when the sun was on its way back to us for three months, uh, that's 90 more days, 90 more days from the first of winter, you will hit something called spring because the sun, which was dead in winter down south, dead to winter, and for us in the northern hemisphere, it's now coming back to us in the northern hemisphere. So we say that the sun is resurrected. He's coming back to life in the northern hemisphere. And so the Hebrews have a, have the celebration of the sun crossing over the equator, which proves it's on its way back to the northern hemisphere. And so they call that celebration of the sun coming back to us to bring life back to the northern hemisphere. The Jews call it the Passover. Why? Because the sun is passing over the equator, coming back to the northern uh, hemisphere where we were starving and freezing up here in the freezing cold Thank God, God's Son, the light of the world, our risen Savior, is now coming back to us in the northern hemisphere. And so on that official day, he, uh, the sun at the equator crosses over our equator, going back north, coming back north to us. The Jews call it the Passover because the sun is passing over the equator. Well, we say the same things. When grandpa dies, we say he passed on last night, or grandmother passed away, or they passed on, or they passed over. And so, therefore, they have died from one, one kind of life and gone to another, so they have passed over. And we say that. Grandpa, grandmother passed over last night. Pass over means that the son was dead in winter, to us in the northern hemisphere, the sun was dead in winter, but now is passing over the equator on its way back to us, thank God. And so the, the, the sun that was dead in winter has now sprung back to life. It's springing back to life. So we call it spring. Spring is the sun passing over the equator, springing back to life. 
And so we call that point spring, because now for the next 90 days, the sun is going to travel back to us, and in 90 days, it's going to hit the lion of the tribe of Judah from spring to summer. And now it starts its annual journey back down. It's going to fall in, in its importance. It's going to fall back down into the southern hemisphere. So the whole story of Jesus in the New Testament is nothing more than telling the old astrological story of the travels of the sun in the sky. Mm. He's born as the, in the constellation of Leo, the Lion King. Disney makes a movie about the Lion King. That's the story in the Bible of the sun worship. The sun in the, in the ancient world was called the Lion. Why? Because the sun, the summer was represented by Leo, the lion, the constellation of Leo, the zodiac. And then uh, when he now is dying, and so now he's being given the kiss of death by Judas, who's giving him the kissing. He's kissing him off. He's going down to uh, Australia. He's going down into the southern hemisphere, and he's going to die. For three days, he's going to die. And thank God, though, on the 25th of December, he moves one degree northward, which, thank God, that tells us he's not going to stay dead. He's coming back to life. So now he's being born again. And therefore, that's why Christians all over the world worship God's Son, the light of the world, and his resurrection is on December 25th is when he's born. Mm -hmm. That's why when in today in the Western world, you see on the on the day that of December 25th, Christians will put on their doors at their homes, Christians will put on their doors, a uh, Christmas wreath, a wreath is on the door. Hmm. Why do you have a Christmas wreath? You've seen Christmas wreaths, they're everywhere. They're made out of holly, and they're made out of the wood of a holly tree, made out of Hollywood. They have Christmas wreaths, hmm. a wreath in the ancient world, always represented a death in the family. And that's why the uh, you will see in the national holidays when the president is, is, is laying a wreath of roses on a burial, it's because the wreath always represented uh, someone has died. Well, God's son died for three days. So that's why you have a, a Christmas wreath on your door, because God's son has died. Right. But thank God... The sun has now been resurrected, and he comes back to life. He's been born again, and now the sun will slowly but surely, over the next 90 days, work its way back into the northern hemisphere and officially will cross over the equator, and it's called the the, uh, the crossover. He crosses over the equator, and it's referred to by the Jews and the ancient peoples as the Passover. The sun has passed over the equator. And now he's coming back to lodge himself into the constellation of Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's going to be hot again. So that's the story. Now, right. here's the point. We are living in a constellational, zodiac constellation today of Pisces, the two fish. That's why Christians, you will see on the cars, they see the fish symbol. The Pope wears a Pope's mitre, which is a fish head, because Roman Catholic Church is promoting the, the, the worship of a fish god named Dagon, D-A-G-O-N. Dagon was a fish god, and so Jesus is referred to as the great fisherman. And so, again, as the son in the age of, a, of, a, of, of uh, Aquarius, is going to be the age you know, that the sun is getting ready to go into. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Right. But right now we're in Pisces, and Pisces is the symbol of two fish. And so we're living right now in the age of the two fish, but there's going to come a day, there will come a day for sure, when there's a, you're going to officially on that 24 hour day, you will officially, officially left the age of Pisces and the next morning will be officially the first day of the age of Aquarius. Right. That which must which, happen. Right. Must which, happen. which we talked about, you know, being about 130 years from now, approximately. I mean, you know, 
Uh, it, it's like that, yeah. right, right in about there. And and that's the interesting thing, too, is you can see it in the symbology because uh, there, there's a common um, appearance of this Jesus fish, I call it, all the time. And you see it on the back mm-hmm. of people's cars and uh, sometimes in uh, uh, jewelry and clothing and things like this. And it says Jesus saves and there's this fish symbol. Well, you know, it does relate to the age, first of all. Secondly, the hints of it are also in the story because uh, what, what did Jesus use to feed the masses uh, to two fish and two loaves of bread, That's which right. is interesting, too, because, well, you know, if you get into the meaning of the word Bethlehem, uh, this is the house of bread. That's so, right. you know, there, there's a lot of things that cross over again, like I said, echoing and continuing to expand this overlapping uh, synchronicity and uh, repetition of the symbols. Um, now, with that being said, There is uh, a couple of quick questions here I want to get to because we're in the last half hour already, believe it or not, Jordan. (laughs) And uh, so I want to enter these, and they may seem a little disconnected, but uh, as per usual, I bring them into the conversation. These might be the last questions of the night, not sure. But um, here we go. Uh, First of all, somebody commented, and it's a long comment, about uh, the fact that my birthday was eight days ago. Uh, And and they asked that... um, and by the way, my birthday's fallen on Easter once for some reason uh, that I recall. But but anyway, it was, it, my birthday's April 7th, but th- that's neither here nor there. Although I have read that some scholars have claimed that the crucifixion of Christ occurred on April 7th. Uh, that, that's and the only odd thing. I don't share a significant birthday with too many interesting people except maybe Alan Dulles. But anyway, <laughs> mm-hmm, um, yeah. you know, what, what does Jordan think about the uh, significance of birthdays? He's talked a lot about the death of uh, the the risen son. What about the birth and where is that mentioned? That is question number one. Uh, question number two, when we boil it down, is about the pope. Uh, here we go again, because you did mention the Pope just now talking about the mitre and we've covered Dagon before. In fact, I gave you guys extra pictures, uh, that are renditions of what Dagon might have appeared to be. And to me, he looks a lot like the Kraken or a sea serpent, but anyway, maybe that's got something to do with it. Again, synchronicity between the religions and the pantheons. Um, Mm -hmm. so Now let's get into this question, uh, which is an ugly, ugly question, and I hate even fielding this, but let's do it anyway. Pope Benedict recently came out with a statement regarding the uh, Catholic sex scandal. Uh, Well, scandal, you say one? (laughs) Anyway, uh, I laugh at that. I'm sorry. Catholic sex scandal. Uh, Relating it to the uh, it being the fault of earlier popes. Pope Francis has made some interesting statements with the burning of Notre Dame and, well, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, with the burning of Notre Dame and a lot of the things that are happening right now and the fact that Jordan has mentioned that uh, a lot of big changes and reckonings are going to be had when it comes to organized religion on a, a previous show. Does Jordan think that uh, that all of this is making sense as it is happening, and does he have anything to say about the fact that one pope is trying to blame another pope, and uh, uh, the current pope is is uh, uh, claiming that there's nothing can be done about this, as Chuck noted on an earlier show? Okay, sorry, that's the whole question, Jordan, and I know it's a little choppy, but this is the way they wrote them. Uh, yeah. So so there you go. You have the two questions about the significance of birthdays and uh, the birth of the son as opposed to the death of the son. Is there anything that you have to say about that? And also, is there anything you have to say about the uh, the Pope's revelations and the current uh, series of events that seems to be unfolding at this particular time that um, this person also feels that you uh, predicted? So, yeah, go well, right I, I'm just telling you that this is exactly what's going to happen because when you go into a church, into a Christian church today, you will see in mainline Christianity, you will see a man hanging on a cross, uh, supposedly Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And actual fact of the matter is, no, it's the sun that dies on the cross of the zodiac. It dies on the cross in the southern hemisphere. It's called the Southern Cross constellation. It's one of the constellations in the southern hemisphere. And so you need to understand that, no, what we're talking about is astrology, the astrological 
outworking of the sun and the planets in our solar system is the basis for the New Testament. The New Testament is nothing more than the astro-theological story or what we call astrology. That's what it is all telling you all about. God's son was in heaven. Of course the son is in heaven. And when you die, you're going to go to heaven with God's son. No, you're not going to heaven with God's son. You're going to hell because hell is Sheol in Hebrew. Hebrew, the word for hell is Sheol, which simply means a grave, period. So if you die, you're going to a grave, well, then you're in, you're in Sheol, according to the Hebrew. And therefore, he, uh, and the word Sheol is translated hell. So therefore, you sing, you're now in hell because you're in the grave, period. Doesn't mean you're going to burn forever and all of that. No, it just means you have gone to sleep with your forefathers. You've gone into the world of the other world, and God knows what happens to you. Then I don't know. I, I suspect there is something on the other side, but I don't know. I haven't been there yet. I'll let you know if I see something. I can come back and tell you. But I haven't been there yet, so I don't know what happens to us when we die. But I'm just telling you what we are, what we are experiencing every day. For one thing, there was no man on a cross in early Christianity. For the first 600 years of Christianity to about the 6th century, there was no man on a cross in any church in, in, uh, in the world today. No Christian church had uh, uh, pictures of a man on a cross. Nothing, none of that ever happened. The man on the cross was put there during about the 600th year after Christianity was founded. 600 years later, they decided to put a man on the cross as a symbol for Christianity. <clears throat> Why? It's so that the church fathers felt that it would make Christianity more important to people if they saw a fellow human laying on a cross, mm -hmm. dying on a cross. They would, they would feel more compelled to, you know, to honor the religion if it see a man dying for them. But no, it has, it has nothing to do with a man dying for you. It has, a, it has to do with the sun giving up its energy, and energy is life, so God's sun is giving his life so that you might live. Well, let me, let me actually ask you a question of my own here, Jordan, uh, because you say that this was uh, utilized even because the fathers of the church thought it would be a good thing uh, for there to be a man on the cross, and okay, I get that reasoning. But... Um, you know, a lot of these symbols that are taken in by the church that are not even necessarily part of their book, that are not part of uh, their canon, really, uh, a lot of these practices that seem to come out of nowhere, um, yep. some of them, I, I believe, and, and this is something you, you can correct me on, but it seems as though um, they took in some elements of pre-existing religions in order to make their practices appear well more familiar to people i think to make it more acceptable while they were spreading christianity you know, you know that that's true absolutely true all the reference books in the world tell you that all the uh, big thick reference books in the bible seminaries mm -hmm. all tell you that's exactly what happened that the ancient people when they were formulating their new religion that they were dreaming up, they accepted some of the the uh, customs of the people uh, of that day into their new religion so that the people would be able to relate to it. It won't be a whole totally new kind of religion that nobody right. wants anything to do with. It has some of the old remnants of you know, the religion that you used to believe. Well, and, and, and see, that's the thing and so about the... therefore, they, yeah. they make it close to what you used to believe. So it's very simple. We just call it Christianity today. But go on and believe the same thing. It all has the same thing. Right. And therefore, people will more readily accept this new religion called Christianity. Well, right. And I think that, that part of the, <laughs> the adaptation of the symbol of, yeah. of the cross had to do with attracting other pagans because various pagan beliefs previous to Christianity had utilized a symbol very similar to uh, to what people would recognize today as the Celtic cross, That's right? exactly right. 
And uh, the, the the Celtic cross, yes, there's a lot of symbolism built into that because there's a lot of uh, interesting artwork that is of a particular style. And we see this in, in places like Ireland and Scotland, uh, you know, pr- pre- prominently displayed uh, as symbols of Christianity. But what they don't recognize is that this preexisted. Christianity, a lot of people don't recognize, I'm not saying you, Jordan, uh, but a lot of people don't recognize uh, that they are literally adhering to older pagan customs by utilizing this very thing. And what were pagans utilizing this symbol for? Exactly the same thing you just explained, which is that they were observers of the sky. They utilized, you know, the the, the zodiac, if you will, uh, in order to understand the world around them it it told them how the seasons were going it told them what time of year it was so they could plant things or move to a different place or store their food so on and so forth there's a very practical reason not just that it encompassed these elements just randomly but i mean there's also practical reasoning behind it you know just like most things if it serves more than one purpose it's definitely a whole lot more valuable so to, to attract the pagans who had other practices uh locally because mm-hmm. there, there were certain pagan practices that were only localized to particular areas in in europe and in other places uh they there were literally gods you know in quotes yep. that mm-hmm. resided only in a particular swamp only in a particular forest only in a particular and and they were thought to be gods by you know and, and pagan by the way uh just just so we get very clear on this when when you use the word pagan in a lot of cases what you're talking about is the common folk the common That's people right. it, it is not about evil it is not about uh oh you know the demonic <laughs> no 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 um, pagan it goes back to a word Right. Uh, and, and it goes back to the Roman Empire when Caesar accepted Christianity as a state religion. <clears throat> it became very fashionable <clears throat> that if you wanted to be in with Caesar and you wanted to be in with the in crowd in Rome, <clears throat> then you would accept this new religion that Caesar would now profess to believe called Christianity with this, with the cross in the sky. And the sun on the cross. And so if you really want to be somebody in in government and in Rome, you now accept a new religion because everybody is doing it. Caesar is now proclaiming himself a Christian. So if you got any brains at all and you want to stay in business, you want to be in with the in crowd, then you accept the new religion called (coughs) Christianity. But in doing so, all of the millions of people in the empire that were out in the hinterlands, out in the in the, uh, the the other countries around the Mediterranean that were not in Rome, hanging out with Caesar and all the in crowd, they were just called the regular people. The regular people, ordinary people, farmers and people, shoemakers and whatever they were, uh, they were living in the empire, but they weren't part of the in crowd like you were. And so, therefore, the people on the in crowd, they were the new Christians. Why? Because Caesar is a Christian. And now I'm going to be a Christian because of it. But the people, the regular people, were referred to in Latin as pagans. Pagans simply meant the poor working class people of the countries all around the world. The pagans were just the regular people who were not connected to Caesar and your Roman Empire. They just were the regular farmers and the regular people who lived their regular lives and had their own belief system. And they were called pagans Mm -hmm. because they weren't like you, a big shot Christian. And so when we say to take pagans, it doesn't mean they were evil, bad. No, they're just like you. You would be called a pagan today because you are not in Washington, D.C., hobnodding around with the president and making the big money and, you know, and being part of the big system that's going on. It's a big system and it's a big club and you ain't in it. So therefore, you're just an ordinary working class person. Therefore, you are a pagan. That was a, a, a Latin word in Rome for an ordinary people or mm. pagans. You know, and because you're talking about Rome here, an interesting question popped up, uh, which I will be more than happy to assist you with because I think I know what they're going after. 
But uh, but then again, I probably don't need to assist Jordan. <laughs> Although Roman history is something I've spent a, a lot of time on. So it's possible that uh, that I might be able to add something to uh, Jordan's answer. Um, here is the question. It is, uh, let's see, where is it? Right. Um, the, the first council of Constantinople in 381... Uh, wasn't this the place where law was established, you know, in a moral sense in the Roman Empire, and therefore didn't it do some good to use these stories after the Council of Nicaea? Okay, that is the whole question. But um, I, I have something to say about law and, and, and Romans' concept of moral or uh, uh, law that, that you're referring to. And uh, it's got nothing to do with Constantine. But anyway, uh, go, go ahead, Jordan, if, if you have anything that you'd like to answer on that. Well, I don't. Uh, yeah, I, uh, there's a lot of uh, unanswered questions about that period of time in Rome with its laws. Mm -hmm. We know that Roman law was very, very difficult. It was a very harsh reality. Roman's law were, Rome's laws were very harsh and cruel. Right. And uh, and so one of the one of the biggest maxims of, of Roman law, one of the biggest uh, bases for Roman law was one of the maxims of Roman law in the ancient Roman Empire said, for he who would be deceived, let him. So Roman law basically meant if you're so ignorant and you don't know how to read and you don't understand law and you don't understand what law is and you're just being deceived. So if you're going to be deceived, you want to be deceived. So let them, let them, let the person be deceived. Let them right. believe whatever they want because they'll find out when they get in the court, we'll straighten them out and throw them into prison. We'll straighten them out. But until then, let the people believe whatever they want about the law. Because when we get them in the court, we're going to teach them a lesson. So right. ignorance of the law is no excuse. Therefore, if you're going to be living in the empire, you might want to find out where is it getting its laws. And what are you talking about when you say law? Who wrote the law? What law? Right. And, and despite the declarations of various people that claim to be experts on Roman law and its evolution, uh, mm -hmm. Jordan is absolutely correct when he says this is a very harsh situation, very difficult, because every time a new Caesar came to power, the laws were altered uh, and, and really profoundly a lot of times. Now, this mm -hmm. concept of moral law was actually introduced by the emperor Justin, Justinian. Uh, which is later on in the empire, not not at this point you're talking about. Um, no. So so I just wanted you to know that, that the listener, not you, Jordan, <laughs> the listener, to know. Uh, let's see, interesting question, Eric. But but the fact is that uh, uh, Roman law, and to talk about it in a very black and white sense, even scholars will argue over exactly what the condition of the people was versus what the law stated. Uh, and, and what the reality was. But this uh, this phrase, moral law, to begin with, doesn't even originate until Justinian. Uh, and, and this is not a Christian um, no. sense of the law at all. This is a whole other thing. Uh, where, That's why the judges yeah. will tell you today. If you understand the law today in America, they will, the judges will tell you there is no justice. There's mm -hmm. just us. Right. And, and as as with today's legal system, like I point out all the time on this show, uh, there is selective enforcement. That's it doesn't right. matter necessarily what the law says, because, you know, another word for judge or another word for God is judge. These judges mm -hmm. do play God and they do make the final decisions, don't they? That's it. And it there's, doesn't matter what you think the law says. It doesn't matter. The judge will decide whatever he's going to decide. And that's what the law says, period. Exactly. So whatever he says, that's what the law is. It's like a cop when he stops you on a motorcycle in traffic. Whatever the cop says the law is, that's what the law is. Why? Because he's carrying a gun. Mm -hmm. And he represents a man with a gun. And the guy with the gun is telling you that this is what you did. So it doesn't matter if you look at the law books and you see there was no law broken. It doesn't matter. He's got a gun. He says that this is what you did. And therefore, he decides what the law is, period. Right. 
So, like I say, it's a very complex subject. Interesting question, though, and the idea about uh, religious uh, canon affecting what is allegedly legal or lawful, right? Mm -hmm. This is an interesting topic in and of itself, one that we certainly don't have time for tonight. But uh, I, I think would be an interesting way to look at it because, you know, a lot of people will tell you that uh, our laws are all based on, what, Judeo-Christian value systems. Um, well, you know, I didn't see anything. I, I don't know. Maybe I missed it, Jordan. But, you know, in, in, in the biblical text, I don't know anything about revenue generation based on the fact that you violated someone's space, even though they don't actually have ownership of it, and how you're supposed to have ownership of things. I don't know. I don't see these laws really being laid out so well in the Bible. Uh you know, the yeah, things know. That, that people yeah. lose their lives and lose everything they ever worked for over quite often because of uh, uh, taxes and, uh, you know, uh, let 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 what is uh, Caesar's be rendered onto Caesar. OK, fine. But seems like everything is actually Caesar's at the end of the day. So uh, in, in, true. In, including you, the You're listener, right. There's no doubt about it. Um, but. Either way, Jordan, we're almost out of time, and uh, I think that these were relative and interesting questions. I think it was good to revisit the concept of what's actually happening in the heavens. The last question of the evening, actually, because I will enter one more, is um, about the fact that uh, we are in April. So, you know, it is at that calendar time of the year that this is being represented in a religious sense in general. And uh, the fact is that uh, when you're talking about the uh, the sun resting on the cross, which it does, that happens in January. That's actually last season. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Why is it that we're doing this now is the direct question. Why is it that the celebration of this happens in spring? In short, if you wouldn't mind, and then after that, we're going to have to close out because that's the end of two hours. But uh, really, I appreciate you taking the time to do this and. Please, if you could explain why it is that we're doing this seemingly an entire season late compared to when it actually happens in the heavens, so to speak. Yeah, well, it's because that's what we humans are always like. We're always changing times, and it says there will be a time when the powers that be will change the times and change the seasons and do a lot of things that change things. But the bottom line is, is that if you keep in mind that uh, the basic story of Christianity in the New Testament is the war between light and darkness, between good and evil, between mm -hmm. intelligence and stupidity. And therefore, the prince of darkness is set because it gets dark at sunset. And God's son is our risen savior because he's the light of the world and light saves us both in energy and intelligence. So... But the one point I want to make in, in, you know, real quick is that there will come a day when one of the constellations of the Zodiac is ruling and there will be a new constellation coming in. And then like the book of Revelation says, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. Yes, the new heavens and the new earth which are coming are going to be Aquarius, the sign of Aquarius, because the 12 apostles asked Jesus in the scriptures, it says the 12 apostles came to Jesus and they said, We're we now know that you're going to die. You're going to be put to death and we know it. Where should we go when you are gone? When you've died, where, sh where are we going to go? What's going to happen to us? And Jesus said to them, and this is in the book of Luke 22, 10. In the New Testament book of Luke, go to 22, 10. And Jesus said to the chosen 12 apostles, he said, go into the city. After I'm dead, go into the city with the, and you will see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Go into the house of the man with the pitcher of water. And so the house of the man with the water pitcher is the house of Aquarius, the man with the water pitcher. So it's explaining to you slowly but surely, you're beginning to see the whole story of the New Testament story of Jesus as an encoded astrological, encoded symbolic story of the heavens. That's why if you ask any eight-year-old child, you believe in God? Yes. Well, where is God? He'll point out there. He's out there. Well, if he's out there, it means he's extraterrestrial. He's not from here. 
if he's out there, he's in the heaven. And therefore, you go out in the morning and you'll see the sun. And where is the sun? At noon, it's up in heaven. So God's sun is in heaven. So we, we say that when we die, uh, when, our, when we die, we'll go into heaven with God's sun and see our family again. No, you won't be seeing your family again. They're gone, and now you're gone. The sun is still in heaven, and he represents everlasting life. As long as the sun comes up, there'll be a life on the earth. Not for you, but for life on the earth. He's right. giving his life so that you might live. All right. One last question, a real quick here, and it's a simple one. Uh, you know, water carriers in the Middle East and, and throughout time are usually women. I, I do wonder if that's really meant to be a woman carrying that pitcher or if it is a man. Uh, you, you have any thought on that? Well, we know that nowhere in the Middle East ever did men carry water. All the Bible reference works and encyclopedias will tell you. Right. Men would never, ever be caught carrying a pitcher of water that was beneath a man. He would never do that. Carrying water was a woman's job, period. It was established and it's done. A woman's job only. Right. So you would never see a man carrying a pitcher of water in the ancient in the old days. And so that's why Jesus is telling you it's it's a, a, an astrological symbol. Going to the house of the man with the water pitcher it was the house of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And so the point I was going to make before uh, was very simple. I want to throw this in real quick. Sure. That there will come a day. I don't know exactly when it is. No man knows the day or the hour but see, you know, the, except the Father in heaven. Right. But nobody knows the day or the hour, but there will come a day, it will come, when it will officially be the last and final day of the age of Pisces. And the next morning, it will be the beginning of the age of Aquarius. So there will come a particular last day of the constellation, of one constellation, and the next day will begin a new 2,150-year period of a new constellation for the sun. And so on that particular day will be the last Passover. And therefore, the last Passover will be the last time the sun officially passes over the equator and the Jews have the last Passover meal. The last Passover meal is called the Last Supper. This is why you have Jesus there with his 12 apostles in the Last Supper. The Last Supper is the last official day of the Passover. When the sun has passed over the equator, it's also passed over the constellation of Pisces. And now tomorrow will officially begin the new age of Aquarius. So there will be a day when it's going to be officially over and done. Mm -hmm. And that's the last Passover meal, the last supper. Right. That's where it comes from. So we'll continue this. We have to continue this whole subject next week. Absolutely, we will. And uh, do want to thank you again, Jordan, for doing this with me. Of course, I thank you guys for listening and uh, do encourage you to Visit jordanmaxwellshow.com. Again, that is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's, and you can join the Research Society over there, get deeper into this subject as well as many others. By the way, you can just email Jordan, too, or make a donation to his well-being directly because that's the only website that uh, Jordan Maxwell is uh, behind. That's it. A lot of other places have his name involved in it. A lot of other places try and use him to uh, make money, to attract web traffic, whatever it is they're using it for. But the fact is that the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's is jordanmaxwellshow.com.